Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Berkshire Conference Call. Uh, today we are uh, with Hal Shirtleff. He's our guest, and he is going to talk about the Conference of States. Um, he was a field coordinator for the John Birch Society at the time that they pushed the Conference of States in the 1990s, and not many people know the history of this, so that's why I brought Hal on the call, and I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to have him here. Uh, I've recently purchased a few books from him because he'll post books online that he has that our old um, history books that are good for people who want to know the truth on but about um, what's been going on in America for a long time and in any ways uh, how's been a good resource for that also um, how is the director of Camp Constitution and it's it's a premier constitutional uh, camp for kids and um, adults I believe can go with them parents can go with them and and enjoy a, a summer camp where we, we learn about patriotism and, and how America was founded and, and why it's so important to keep our constitutional republic. Uh, thank you, Hal, for being on the call. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be on the, to be on the call. And when you had a picture of the March 6, 1995 New American uh, that says ConCon Con Call with Mike Levitt, former governor of Utah, I said, oh, man, I this brings back some really fond memories of JBS act, uh, act, activism. Yeah, and it wasn't. It, it's it's it hasn't been mentioned much in the last few years, although it should. I think um, this is a um, an important part of history, where our uh, our entire constitutional republic was at stake due to the Utah governor and the Nebraska governor at the time. Not just due to them; they were really the front people. Right. For an organized effort to destroy our constitutional republic. That's correct. Well, before we get into it, just a, a quick little background. I proudly served on the staff of the JBS for 26 years as a New England coordinator and then a regional field uh, director for a while. Uh, and I joined the society in 88, started a chapter within, I don't know, six or seven months. And I did what wasn't supposed to be done. I recruited people. Uh, in Boston. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Hey, you're not supposed to do that. They're all liberals in Boston, the leftists. And, uh, but we, uh, I, I left the staff and uh, started uh, w w working full time for an entity called Camp Constitution, which I'm the co founder. And it's uh, pretty much philosophically uh, very comp completely compatible with the JBS. A lot of our JBS people uh, participate in the camp. And uh, you mentioned the books. Uh, we've been blessed with some donations, uh, a few estates that were left to us. And we do sell some of the books on Amazon, but many of them I put up. And what's interesting is that there are a lot of new people into the patriotic movement, but they haven't heard about some of these books by Gary Allen or Alan Stang or Robert Welch or all the other great writers, Anthony Sutton and so forth. And most of the books they're getting would be sort of, I would say, neocon stuff that's published, uh, you know, Hannity and Limbaugh. They're not really getting. Uh, and one of the books we actually put back in print is Color Communism and Common Sense, which every single JBS member probably had by in the 60s, 70s and 80s. But um, and another great book is, um, again, May God Forgive Us, the story of how communist China fell into the hands uh, and how our old how we right. played a role in that. So, so the website's campconstitution.net, and we do run a great family camp. We have unaccompanied minders as well as whole families. And John, John McManus is going to lead off the first day of classes with an overview of America, and we have Lord Moncton attending, Professor Willie Soon, and this obscure guy by the name of Alex Newman, right? A few people oh, know man. who he is. <laughs> He's going to be there for the week, and uh, so we get some other great speakers too. So, uh, Oh, anyway, uh, well, my, so my, I'll it. just tell you, I'll, I'll tell you my favorite book that I, I think you guys publish is um, Alpha Phonics by Samuel oh, Bloomfield. Yeah. yeah, well, actually, we I inherited Sam's library and papers. Now, he passed away in um, June of nine, uh, 2015. He had just turned 89. Mm -hmm. And Thursday, he, he died on a Monday. And the last time I saw him was Thursday. In fact, I introduced Alex Newman and Sam. They, they wrote mm -hmm. the book together, Crimes of the Educators, but they hadn't met. Mm -hmm. And I got a hold of Alex, and he had planned to see Sam in the summer. And I said, you've got to come up here now. So we actually had a, a friend of mine that flew him up, covered his cost. And mm -hmm. it was so bad. But I was hoping to get an interview between the two of them. But Sam had deteriorated so much, it wasn't possible. But he mm -hmm. said on his death, he said, 20 years ago, he said to me that I will do this till I drop. Well, he's on his deathbed 
signing copies of his book. You know? Wow! <laughs> uh, and I, we, but we made a pledge that I said, we pledge, Sam, that your work will influence unborn generations. And thanks to Mark Affleck, a JBS chap leader, who's our camp newspaper editor and our webmaster, Eric Conover, we got, I went through 200 plus boxes of materials and a lot of his uh, stuff was scanned in and it's up on our website under the Samuel Blumenfeld archive. Last year, 2 million, 2 million views and it's all free. We do accept donations, of course, but you can get the alpha phonics. You can teach people how to read right on our website, teach handwriting, teach basic arithmetic. And we've got about two or three weeks worth of recordings and MP3 and MP4. So it's a great resource. So please uh, go to the, all we ask for is a username and, and um, email address. And please share that with as many people. And Sam was a longtime JBS member, a very proud JBS member since the early 60s. He was a close friend of Robert Welch. And I have their correspondence up on the website. I have correspondence between Sam and many of the council members. Uh, it, it, so it's it's really encor- encouraging. If you uh, Sam was also one of the um, the founders of um, these J- Jewish Society of Americanists, yeah. and all that uh, is up there. Probably the only place in the world that's available. So wow. And we'll get into the topic of the call. But the reason I mentioned that book is my son is five years old, and he's almost finished with the Alpha Phonics book that Samuel Blumenfield wrote. And he that's is amazing, an um, incredible reader right now at the age of five. And even at the Christian school that we send our son to, they are teaching him with the whole sight word reading method. And that's the only, that's the only Christian school option we have nearby our house. And mm-hmm. as, as we know, the whole sight word reading method is not the correct way to teach children. In fact, it can harm them. Um, but um, I, I think from what I've studied from Alex, as long as you get them through the alpha, when I say Alex, Alex Newman, if you get right. them through the alpha phonics, you're, you're, they're, the kids are going to be okay. No well, matter. They'll have that, yeah. They have that alpha phonics reflex, as what Sam said. So they'll see. Yeah. They'll, they'll see. You know, a Spot had a dog, and they'll be able to uh, read it phonetically, not uh, through you know looking at it like it's a picture. So yeah. Well, we'll and get on to the to, to to the topic of the call, the Conference of States. Now, why why does the Convention of States project leadership? Why do they not want us to know about the Conference of States? Well, uh, let me – it's interesting. I uh, had corresponded with Mark Meckler through email way back when he was sending me emails every other day, you know, his organization. And he actually did respond, and I made reference to the Conference of States. He said, I've never heard of it. So he was either – he was either – maybe he didn't hear of it because I don't think he's all that well informed on things. As uh, Robert Brown uh, demonstrated at, at a hearing, I think it was in the Montana when he didn't even know uh, how certain amendments were passed, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, or he's lying. But the Conference of States uh, was something that was promoted back in late 95, 94, early to mid uh, 95, and we got involved. This would be the JBS in January. Twelve states had already passed resolutions in both house, houses. Uh, without a hearing, they just sort of galled it through. Wow! And then we we knew something was in. We thought, oh my goodness! And all they were looking for was a simple majority, twenty six states. So we we were really pressed. And I think there was a few other organizations that were opposing this, uh, Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, and there may have been one or two others. But the JBS played. Uh, you know, we took the major role. Um, and I remember, say, I covered Massachusetts, so the New England states, and I was, of course, I had colleagues that were worked together in Pennsylvania. But what happened in Massachusetts, it had passed the House without any debate, without any hearing. And I had a, a, a friend that was in the, US, the, the Senate, and I would tell him about it, and he didn't pay any attention. Then he gets a letter from the Levitt's group. And they basically said, um, pay no attention you know, to the man behind the curtain, so to speak, right? Don't pay any attention to those conspiracy mongers. That got his attention. He mm-hmm. called me and he said, Hal, I want you to write up a resolution. I'll introduce it. And we were able to defeat it without ever going into the committee to have a hearing on it. Wow. We got an intel. Uh, and by the way, there was one of the unsung heroes of this battle was a, name, a man named Doug Kelly. I don't know if that, that name resonates with anybody here, mm-hmm. but Doug was a black gentleman that lived in the south side of Chicago. His brother was an alderman, um, uh, uh, 
And he, this was before internet, right? So he would call state houses all over the country and befriend staff members, phone, phone friends, and he would get intel. So he heard of this meeting in Florida that took place, I think, in January or February of 95, where Democrats were there planning to uh, sneak these things through. So both you had, you had neocons in the Republican Party, you had Democrats pushing this. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a call from, um, at that time, my, uh, my, my boss, there, Jim Fitzgerald. He said, Hal, there's, uh, we got word uh, that man, one of our guys was at the meeting here, somehow got in there without them knowing. And he said, a woman by the name of Lois Pines, who's a Democrat from Massachusetts, said that we're going to pass this resolution in an informal session. That's how we get all this stuff done. I said, oh, great. I know who she is. I called her office within a minute after the call. And oh, she's not here. She's in Florida. Oh, that's what I thought. She's at this meeting. And I understand she's trying to get this thing through. And oh, they were really uncomfortable. So Mm -hmm. we were able to actually get uh, Democrats and Republicans to oppose it. And it never came to committee. The same thing in Maine. We were gearing for a fight, you know, we're ready to roll. The resolution had been introduced and it was withdrawn. In Vermont, another example, they passed it. uh, It may have been in the Senate or one of the house, one of the two houses. And then when we, uh, they were having, they were having hearings on the bill or the resolution and the, and we had 15, uh, 15 people in Vermont. a lot. That's like half the state, right? (laughs) Wait, (laughs) camping out at the committee room. And the chairman said, you know, there's something fishy about this. This is uncomfortable. It never passed. It, it died. And Pennsylvania, it was almost a miracle. And I do believe it was a miracle. One of our chapter leaders um, had read the bulletin. You know, he did. He said, I didn't really prepare for the meeting. You know, so I just kind of went through the motions and, oh, uh, we have to do something about this conference of the states. And, you know, then he adjourned. Then he said, you know, I, 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 I couldn't sleep that night. I said, this is really bad. What the heck? Why was I, why was I so dismissive of this? So he, he got a few, called a few people at two or three in the morning. You know, some burgers are pretty dedicated people. I mean, most people get a call at two or three in the morning. They're not, they're not going to answer the phone or they tell you to, you know, <laughs> they'll hang up angrily. So they drove to the Capitol, about a half a dozen of these dedicated birchers, and they didn't know the Capitol area that well. You know, it's a big building and they didn't. And the first person they bumped into was the committee chairman that was hearing testimony on that. And uh, it was supposed to happen that day. He said, look, we have. So they said, put her. He said, tell you what, I'll give you a few days. And that's how they brought in Don Fotheringham. They brought in Phyllis Schlafly and it, it, and it was killed. And this stuff was happening all over the country, state after state. As, uh, and it didn't it just didn't make any headline news. The mass, you know, the corporate media didn't come out in, in favor or against this. This was very, very um, quiet. Now, Levitt, it shows you what a hypocrite he, he was or is. Levitt was talking about, first off, he was denying that this was a Article 5. He didn't use the word Article 5 convention, by the way. He used the word Constitutional Convention. He spoke to a group in Western, you know, Western something group, where he used the word Constitutional Convention. So this really wasn't, this was an extra constitutional thing. This was the states, the states asserting their sovereignty. And, mm-hmm. and that was what they had proposed to do. They were going to start proposing amendments. He kept on backpedaling and he kept on saying, we need to restore the balance between federal and state. And of course, this gets a lot of people excited. Well, wait a minute now. There's not supposed to be a balance. There's supposed to be, you have, this federal government has few and defined powers. Right. The rest retain to the states. What's this about? There's no seesaw here. You know, you, we send you guys down to make sure the, the borders are secure. We have a, an army or a military that's going to protect us from foreign invasion and a few other things. It, you know, that's, that's it. You know, it's yeah. all listed in the Constitution. What do you mean balance? You know, we, we, the state's supposed to have all kinds, of, all kinds of powers reserved to the states and to the people. It says that right in the Constitution. But when he left the office of governor of Utah, guess where he went? You know where he went? Mm. Mr. Too Much Federal Government, George H.W. Bush appointed him. No, I'm sorry. George W. Bush appointed him the director of the EPA. Oh, that's not surprising. So An unconstitutional a, organization that's ran by the federal government. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah. doesn't, the EPA, doesn't the federal government own about more than half of Utah? You know, it'll be, you know it's all federal land. No. Oh, man. What a, what a bad thing to do to the people of Utah by, by becoming – uh, the the man in charge of the EPA, you know, 
Wow. That, that just, that blows my mind. I'm but not surprised see, we, though. Yeah. You know, what's interesting um, on the, on the more recent article five, uh, New Hampshire has one of the places that they, they, they targeted back in 2012 and 13. We were successful in getting all of New Hampshire's application, had about half a dozen rescinded in 10, 2010. Mm-hmm. But they got one, uh, they got the so-called balanced budget uh, amendment uh, resolution passed. And we know that it doesn't matter what it says, an Article 5 is an Article 5. And some of our friends were in the committee and they voted for it. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, it was the way it was worded, you know. They didn't read the fine print. I said, ah. So, uh, but they, uh, both Wolfpack and Convention of States spent thousands, hundreds, of, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. They had full-time lobbyists. Uh, the, the Wolfpack, uh, Ryan Clayton, uh, I used to see him in there schmoozing with the uh, state reps and so forth. They actually lived in New Hampshire for a while. Wow. And every and, and they would say they would pass the committees. And one year it passed the Senate and it went to the House. It passed the House committee. I was in the executive session with with our friend there, your friend there, Mike. Um, Mike. Um, oh, Patrick Henry College. Mental oh, block, oh, Michael yeah. Ferris, Michael Ferris, yes. Michael Ferris, yes, Michael Ferris, yes. So, mm-hmm. And it passed the committee, and then it went to the full House. And I got a chance to speak to some Republicans at a gathering the day of the vote, and Ken Quinn, that, uh, that scoundrel Ken Quinn, a dishonest man that he is, and I'll say that, and I hope he hears this because he is a dishonest person. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually accused us of bribing a state senator. It was a total lie. Uh, but anyway, that's another issue. So uh, anyway, I made my case, and they defeated it, and they used parliamentary procedure. They waited to the very last minute. It was a long session, and they were going to go out of session, I think, pretty close, like 9 p.m., and uh, they had 15 people on our side to debate. I mean, they've they been there for 20 – it seemed like 15 hours and so my friend there, Janine Nauta, said, uh, motion to table, and it was let's get out of here, and they tabled it. But the last two sessions, we've been able to defeat it by a wide margin. Uh, the term limits, the balanced budget, the Wolfpack. Uh, last this earlier this uh, this in January, 18 to one against the the term limit uh, application, and now we have a resolution that passed the committee of 18 to one, I think, to rescind their one application. So we think we have a very good case. So all the money they had. All of the lies, all of the dirty dealings, it still wasn't enough to get our, any resolutions passed and, and from, from uh, 2010 on, uh, 12 on, 13 and onward. Wow. So that should be encouraging. That should so, be encouraging so to people. The yeah. question for everybody, I think, here, because a lot of people, I think, are coming from the uh, – there's probably a few South Carolinians on this call. Um, and why would the globalists – who've been wanting to call this Article 5 Constitutional Convention since, uh, I mean... The 70s. The 70s, yeah. really, right? The, since Zbigniew Brzezinski called for it. He, he, he talked about Big it in his brother. book. Why, why is it that they would not use the left right now? Because the left is very silent on the Article 5 Convention. In fact, in South Carolina, it is the Democrats are against it, and the Republicans are for it, basically. That, that, it, it's, like, it's like the... Um, uh, the um, Wolfpack group has called off their people in conservative states on purpose. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. I think it's just a tactic. And of course, those who oppose it are based in the eyes of the Convention of States is, have this narrative that if you support it, if you oppose an Article 5, you're working for George Soros. Mm-hmm. When George Soros and his gang of globalists they hate the Constitution, and right. they're working very hard. They would love to rewrite it. But I think there's a lot of well – I mean I've known some pe- – I have some friends who still support it. Some change their mind, mm-hmm. and they, I don't understand. They get a blind side, but I don't think that they're evil. You mm-hmm. know, They just for some reason uh, haven't really done their homework, or maybe they're convinced it's a good idea. Some people say, oh, we'll scare Congress into passing. But these amendments – you know, it, it, even if there wasn't any move to rewrite our Constitution, I mean, balanced budget. Well, if we had a constitutional budget, we would have a surplus every year. You know, a yeah. balanced budget will not guarantee uh, no tax increases. It won't guarantee that. Oh, 
and there's an escape clause of these proposed amendments, and you've seen them. Yeah. Uh, there's two escape clauses, and that one of them is a war, and the other is a, a national uh, emergency. Right. So I tell people, I said, if they pass one of these amendments, you've now made a national emergency constitutional. It's not in the Constitution. It's something that was a construct, I think, from the Wilson administration. Not only will you make that constitutional, you will give the federal government no incentive to ever get out of a national emergency. So one of these congressmen will say, hey, look, I'm a, I'm a fighter. I try to fight for the people and lower taxes, and I passed this amendment, but darn it, what can you do? You know, all this work for nothing, you know, mm-hmm. and term limits, you know, the founders were against term limits. That's what they had in the Articles of Confederation. You know, I tell people, look, if I was uh, riding a plane and they term limited pilots, oh, this guy's only got six years. You know, a guy who's got 15 or 20 years experience knows a whole lot more about it than someone who's just been doing it for a couple of years. Right. Right. The same thing with any profession. So. What's wrong with having a good politician in there who knows the ropes? I mean, Ron Paul, he served more than two terms. Right. Uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, well, I guess they're, they're trying to do it, what, six, two six-year terms or, or for a member of the House or whatever the case is. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, to me, sometimes it's just getting warmed up, you know, that they really know that they, they have the connections. It's like you as a coordinator. Uh, imagine if we had term limits for coordinators. It takes a while to build relationships with people, to get I, to know folks in other organizations. I can't just do I that. Like I feel like at the five-year mark, I'm finally getting used to my job. <laughs> finally, That's right. I can finally yeah. do it, you know, correct. After It, it does yeah. take a lot of learning. It does. You can't just jump into something without without that. So the same thing with a, with a, with a, uh, with a statesman. You know, and uh, Neil, as Don Fotheringham in his article, Revolving Socialist, that he wrote back in the 90s. So you get rid of a big government uh, Democrat and you just elect his staffer, you know, <laughs> because you haven't changed the you haven't changed the uh, the voting, the way the voters think. You right. know, so what's the we got rid of Ted. Well, Ted Kennedy died. And uh, uh, the guy, there's a senator now that Markey, he was uh, he ran um, Scott Brown had won the seat for two years. And then now you got a guy named Ed Markey. Oh, no, I think when John Kerry became ambassador, that seat opened up. I think that's maybe what happened. Mm-hmm. So um, so Ed Markey is definitely a Marxist. He was a member of the House, and now he's a senator. Wow, great. What a wonderful, what, what, a, great, what a great difference. You know, now, you've got a, now you've got a Marxist uh, that's, that's in the Senate. Uh, well, one no thing that's really here, interesting you know. to me, and I think, you know, Don, uh, or not, Mike Levitt, you know, the Utah governor, he, he was obviously trying to scam the people. I mean, especially since he became the EPA, you know, um, if, if, if I was appointed to the EPA to be in charge of it, the first thing I would say is I will have to dissolve my own organization that I'm in charge of because it's unconstitutional, right? Um, <laughs> you, you, that, that's, well, I would tell, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think Mark Meckler is, is, is in the same situation. It, it, he, is, he is part of a, in his mind, he is scamming people because I've seen the way they've worked. And um, it's, it's the but there, you're right there are good people that are in the convention of states volunteer you know um leadership positions let, that that are let, people let me pose a question with. yeah let me pose a question let's say that you are new to the john birch society or you were interested mm-hmm. and you someone said to you well you know john mcmanus and r thompson i see them hanging out with van jones you know and there's a picture of art and and uh, John McMahon is uh, hovering around Van Jones, and um, who is the lady that's ahead of Soros's group? Um, uh, what's the name oh, of that group? Uh, uh, the Wolfpack uh, group? No, not no. the Wolfpack, but um, it's a oh. it's his, his big uh, political group. Um, mm. Open, open, oh, move, move on, move on, move on. Yeah, yeah, move yeah, on. yeah, yeah. And so, Mark Meckler uh, Mac- would... does have a picture with her. I I, I know he tried to cozy up to her. Yeah. Yeah, and you would say, wait a minute now, what's going on here? I don't think I want to belong to a group whose whose member whose leadership is hobnobbing with uh, with these folks. Well, right. if you go to a website called Living Room Conversations, you will see it's actually a left wing group that uses the Delphi technique, right? You'll mm-hmm. see Mark Meckler and Van Jones as champions. They're listed as champions of this organization. Wow. And Mark Meckler has a quote which I screenshot because I, I think I haven't checked it in a while. When I testify at some of these hearings, I say the best argument against an Article 5 convention was made by Mr. Mark Meckler. 
And he said that he's saying in this quote, which again you can find on the website, he said that elites at both the state capitals and the, uh, that they're fighting against the elites that run the states and that run the D.C. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, I said to him, so he's saying that elites run the state capitals, and the state capitals will be in charge of an Article Five convention. Right, right. He doesn't name who these elites are, but he alludes right. to these elites. You know, and of course, uh, <laughs> that doesn't. It doesn't make put Mark Meckler in a very good uh, position. Right. Well, I, I thought what was very telling was when he was in South Carolina, he actually said that he agreed with George Mason that the Constitution should not have been signed. Oh, really? And, and that, was, that, was, that was a little bit of a surprise to me because I thought, well, that just the, right there, that means that you're not supportive of the decision our founders made when they did sign the U.S. Constitution. And this was recorded. This is this was part of the Article 5 study committee that, that was put together. So this was his, his second speech that he gave on, on the topic of uh, convention, his Convention of States arguments. But um, to me, I think that it just went to show he is so frustrated with the federal government. If it, Let's say he is not scamming people. Let's say this is an honest you know, um, which I don't think it is, but let's say it is. If if he's let's say he's really trying to do good for the American people, I think his argument really is is the U.S. Constitution doesn't work, and and we need mm-hmm. we need something else. And well, so he, uh, he, Mike yeah. Ferris, Mike Ferris, uh, in the video that I don't know if it's still on the Convention of States website, but he said we don't need to change the basically Congress. We need to change the structure. Now, you ask any engineer when you're advocating structural change, you're advocating fundamental change. Right. So even in his own video, I mean, are they aware of what they're saying? Structural change. He's advocating a 50-member Supreme Court, much like the European model. Are you serious? I mean, bad enough we get nine people usually going against the interest of the American people. And right. they'll be wrote every six years. They'll be up for you know up for election or up for appointment. Wow, we will have a permanent lame duck s- Supreme Court. Mike, are you serious? You're supposed to be a pretty smart guy. You know, you started a college. You know, <laughs> I had I had a little fun with him when that when that executive session. Yeah, and uh, he's trying to make the case that uh, those who oppose an Article Five convention say the Constitution was signed illegally. You know, that's I said, Mike, you teach logic at your school. I said, that's a straw man fallacy. I don't yeah. know anyone in our corner, on our in our camp. I said, there may be a couple. I don't know of any that advocate that position. You know, and I said, I took an oath of office uh, when I was 17 years of age to defend this Constitution. And uh, so, you know, you're not winning. Any, you're not scoring any points with me with that one. Then, then they had to tell us to hush up. They were starting their session. <laughs> and and Mike Ferris was there, but you said Wolfpack was there as well, right? So so Mike Ferris oh, yeah. was very well aware Wolfpack, that Wolfpack was yeah. Wolfpack and Convention of States were hobnobbing. They were meeting together. Uh, they had little luncheons together, you know, informal luncheons, while they were denying any connection. But I know when Ryan Clayton came in there shaking hands with the Convention of States people and. Oh, yeah. And and by the way, Clayton, um, he left uh, Wolfpack. Uh, he is he's he's the one that was arrested throwing Russian little Russian flags in the uh, near Trump back about three years ago. He crying oh, trees wow. and Trump is treason. He's also the one that was stalking a staff member of um, Veritas, you know, J- uh, James O'Keefe's group. And what's okay. interesting is O'Keefe, O'Keefe came out and supported the Convention of States. I got a hold of him. I said, "Hey, you better talk, you better check look into this." I said, uh, "Wolfpack is uh, Ryan Clayton used to work for was, was their executive director, yeah. and he worked with Convention of States." He said, "Oh, I didn't know that." Yeah, well, you better <laughs> know that. You know a whole lot of stuff, but you don't know this one. Yeah, I know some people that are endorsers of the Convention of States project, and I, I, I not all of them. But I, there's a couple of them there. I'd like to talk to and say, "Do, do you really know what, know what you got yourself into when you co- when you decided to endorse it?" Because right now you're on there, and and by the way, they had Judge Scalia there as an endorser, but then people I pointed out the fact that Judge Scalia was was long gone before you know he he had passed away, he, and then after his death they decided, oh well, Justice Scalia must have endorsed the Convention of States project, which which was a complete fraud. Which is just the uh, he did back in the seventies. He made a comment favorable, and he did. They weren't calling it Convention of States. He called but it. Then a, he was he with, called it a Constitutional Convention. Yeah, that's right. R- correctly, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, uh, so here he, uh, but he was on a on a TV show with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and like somebody raised the question, he said, "Whoa, we don't want to have one." You know, he said, "We don't want to have one of these." Was well, interesting too. I I have a little fun. All these there's a lots of resolutions that are have been introduced uh, passed uh, on the books that use the term constitutional convention to refer to an Article Five. Mm-hmm. So I said to one of these convention of states guys, I said, "Will you work with me to make sure that you know that we can rescind these because that's not an Article Five. That's something else, right?" Mm-hmm. Oh, they didn't want to, and they and they used the argument. They used to use the argument. Well, states have conventions all the time and nothing dramatic, which is not true. And they stopped using that as they did this a little bit of research. I said, how come they call state conventions constitutional conventions? Why don't they become conventions of cities or convention of counties, you know? Right. <laughs> no, well, they don't want to hear that one either, you know? Well, so. how, how can people reach you if they want to, you know, go to your camp or if they want to order books from you? Well, uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can f- friend me on Facebook, Hal Sherlock. There's a few other shirtlifts, but I'm the original one. We're all related to. And, uh, but you'll see Boston Camp Constitution. Or just go to our website, campconstitution.net. And we have some great resources. We, on our YouTube channel, we have an Article 5 playlist. I actually got Cenk Huger and, um, and Larry Lessig advocating a runaway convention. I know was at that event I've seen in 2011. That. Yeah. yeah, so we got a, I got a lot. I have Mark Meckler uh, running away from the media after he goes arrested. I said, here's this great leader. Uh, you know, instead of, you know, me, hey, I, what I did, I was, you know, I, he was arrested. Uh, and I don't think, you know, it was too bad. He got arrested in New York for having a concealed gun and he didn't know the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, but instead of, you know, uh, hanging around, he decided to run away. And boy, he hopped over that fence. He's pretty athletic. I have to hand him that. <laughs> but there's a lot of good stuff on there. I got Robert Brown. Robert Brown, we sponsored Robert Brown up in Maine. We had a press conference, and only our, most of the people that showed up were convention state supporters. Mm-hmm. And boy, Robert schooled those guys. It was a thing of beauty, and that's on the video too. So if you go to our YouTube wow. channel and just put in an uh, article, there's a playlist that says, uh, I think it's Con Con or Stop the Con Con or something like that. And you get some okay. great, some, and we have uh, some good resources on our website too, uh, some downloads. And you that Constitution.net, uh, right? Yes. And the article, mm-hmm. The New American, the March 6, 1995, mm-hmm. I, have, I have PDF versions of that, and if anybody would like it, it's really important stuff. I don't know if the JBS is archiving it or not, but if anyone would like we, we, a copy We do of that, have it archived, could, yes, but, but okay. they can get it from you too. Yeah, oh, I, could, I, could post, yeah I could post it. Well, anyone who's, anyone who's listening, uh, if they want to get a hold of me, just say, hey, Hal, here's my email address. I'll um, uh, shoot me a uh, – Shoot, uh, send it to me in a PDF. I'll be happy to do that. Well, thank you, Al, Hal, for being on this well, call, you. and we'll just uh, move on to the Q&A session. I am going to end the recording, so thank you all for joining, and, and uh, if you do want to stick around for the Q&A session, uh, we're, we're getting ready to get to that, so just give me a few seconds here.